So you know how to ride a motorcycle in the city, in the back country, on scenic routes, in curvy twisties, maybe even on the racetrack. But have you ever taken your passion for two wheels out into the wilderness, over rocks and stones, over endless sand dunes, far away from civilization, straight into the heart of California's deserts and mountains. Little did we know what we were in for when we followed Admo Tours on their famous LA to Vegas adventure. When you first hear the name LA to Vegas, it doesn't sound very exciting, dangerous, or even remotely interesting. What? We're going from one big city to another crazy city? That's just endless miles of straight freeway, right? Cars, cars, and more cars? Nah, I think we're just gonna go up PCH to San Francisco. Sure, PCH is nice, the right time of year, but it could also be foggy all the time. But I promise you, you have no idea what you're in for going with Admo through the desert and the mountains. It's the adventure and challenge of a lifetime. And no, you don't have to be an expert dirt rider to do this trip. We were just two street riders with one day of experience on the dirt a whole year earlier. So you feel like you're an off-road pro now? Ready to slip and slide? I sure do. Okay. Physical rides, not hard enough. No, really? <laughs> that's good, that's good. Imagine that just like the Hobbit Frodo, you're in your comfort zone with your bike, staying close to your home roads. Then suddenly, in comes Admo, like Gandalf the Wizard, and sweeps you away on a remarkable adventure, taking you to places you've never thought of going with your bike. Seeing historic sites from the old gold rush that you thought were buried in history, discovering ancient petroglyphs from Native American Indians speaking to us as through a time machine going from heights close to the top of the Americas down to hundreds of feet below sea level and of course improving your riding skills by steering your wheels through an endless changing terrain of sand, stone, rocks, mud and even snow. Yes, in February it's cold at 9,000 feet. This is the story, how we rode through the Mojave Desert and all the things we discovered in the wilderness that were as amazing as the ride itself. It all begins at Admo headquarters in Wrightwood, California. Okay, you guys, welcome to Admo. We're here. Come on in. Welcome to our LA to Las Vegas tour. The three day tour is about 450, 480 miles. Um, I never know it 100% sure because it all depends on what we will encounter on the route and it is an adventure and you never really know until you have done it. The map which you have here shows you three different sections of three different days. You're gonna have a variety of climates which you go through, a variety of terrain which you're gonna go through. The first day is probably somewhat around 120 miles. It's not too much of a pressure on that first day. Gonna have some trails. Almost like single trails starting out in the first part and then suddenly it gets wider and wider open. Some straight riding, some diversity, some OHV type of riding like you had found at El Mirage. We're actually gonna go just around the El Mirage area. You're gonna see this here. It says Cuddyback Lake. That's a dry lake bed coming over the dry lake bed, possibly going to a place called the Husky Monument. 
So early the next morning we were off. Almost immediately we hit the dirt trail full of whoops that after a while turned into wide open desert. trying to process the ground surface and what path to take through bushes, rocks and rabbit holes. And yes, we did make it to the so-called Husky Monument. We are here at Husky Monument. What you see here is the Husqvarna 390 from the year of uh, 1978. It was placed here about 23 years ago in honor of Jim Erickson. Jim Erickson, one of the founders of the Desert Zebras Racing Club, uh, the trails here, the trail here was one of his favorite trails. So they cemented his bike out here with his plaque as a memorial for him. And over the years, many new plaques of friends and family, of riders, of uh, racers, of off-road enthusiasts came together here. Back in the 1990s, we were members of a motorcycle club called the Conejo Trail Riders, or CTR. And uh, Big Mac, uh, short for Bill McInerney was our president back then. Bill was a great guy, uh, a heck of a rider, and just a wonderful person to be around. All right, here we have uh, Norm Stewart. This is a gentleman that uh, spent 56 years of racing. And when I started actually racing in desert when I was 14 with my dad and my family, he was the only guy that I would ever see that had gigantic beard. And he would actually just roll in and come in. And one of the things that he was most famous for is he never missed a race. You know, I don't, like the other guys, I, I don't know anybody out here. But, uh, you know, just being a motorcycle enthusiast, you, you have something in common with every one of these people. And I think it really shows a positive tribute to the uh, motorcyclists and, and outdoor enthusiasts all share together. Thor boots and, and pistons and sprockets and it's all something, you know, it's all, we're all tied together with this and it's uh, very moving. We knew that this was going to be sort of an endurance ride, hundreds of miles on dirt roads. What we didn't expect was that there were hardly any roads at all. At this time of year, the desert was in full bloom. Good timing on our part, since they only last a couple of weeks. The ground was carpeted with color. I admit, I had always thought of the desert as a bunch of dry nothingness. With the help of Uwe Diemer's incredible interest and knowledge of this area, I feel I have discovered a whole new world. Well, hang on a moment. So who is this guy Uwe Diemer? And what makes him so special? Well, it turns out that Uwe has ridden his motorcycle across the world. Out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Sahara, and I'm losing fuel. And what seems to be like a dry lake, it's actually muddy. Whoa, oh, 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 first, yeah. I burnt the clutch right, right in the middle of the Sahara. And suddenly he brought the money. And the money was on the counter this much money. <laughs> I couldn't load it on my motorcycle. Crossed Argentina, crossed Chile, spent several months in Bolivia, went into Peru and then cross the Amazon jungle. You, you, you're going down that trail, there's no sign. There's no, nothing real tells you that you're on the real trail. Had I had a lot of trees covering the trail. You unload your luggage, you build a little ramp, you drive your bike over the tree, you load again, you keep going. You don't want to turn around. 
<laughs> but you don't know what's ahead of you. So I had a machete and I cut some bamboo, uh, nice pieces of bamboo this size, and I made myself a track going across the swamp. I hammer into the tree and it was like steel on steel. It just made bang, bang, and no wood was flying at all. Was the monkeys were sitting around me in a half circle and I was in the middle. It didn't look like anything, you know, I cruise in relatively slow and my front end whoop slides out and my whole bike was gone. But come on, I'm now <laughs> almost two years on the road. Nothing is waterproofed anymore. I had this, this, this sandy water just everywhere and also in the gearbox. So he drilled it out, put the Toyota sleeve in it and off we went again. <laughs> You know, I carried very few spare parts. After my Africa experience, I carried a clutch with me. <laughs> it's floating, got a big bamboo, and I get this thing over to the other side. We're loading the bikes in, getting everything on this side of the river. She had a bite, like a fingernail size, of a piranha right in her leg. We got to pitch the tent right here. And the swamp is full of crocodiles. Also, the crocodiles are not uh, aggressive animals. Uh, except if they would be very hungry. I wake up in the morning and I hear this noise, like um, something I'm peeking out of my tent and I see this giant hippo, hippopotamus. So as you can hear, the stories are endless and they are entertaining, interesting and a little bit scary. So being out with Uwe as a guide is like having a guide that's a mix between Malcolm Smith and David Attenborough. I think it's very difficult to imagine for anybody. I think it's very difficult to imagine, especially for foreigners or for people from the eastern part of the country. We have such a wide open, fast terrain out here. As soon as you're away from the towns, as soon as you leave this uh, uh, greater metropole area of Los Angeles, you will not see people, you will not see houses, you will not see cars or anything out there in the desert. You're going to be out there by yourself for the next three days, having your guides and your buddies along on the ride. So Robert, Denise, tell me, you come from Canada and you're riding in the California desert. What's that like? Well, it's warmer than it is at home. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm loving it. Yeah. Great terrain, good variety. Was it difficult? Was it harder than you expected? Some parts, yeah. yeah. Definitely some of the rocky sections. I had a bit of trouble. You're still here? I'm still here. All right. <laughs> So how long have you been planning this? Is this something you've been dreaming about? Or was it a spur of the moment type of trip? Or? Well, we did another ride previously with Admo, and uh, this was on their list, and it seemed like a, a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> but you're a very good rider. Was it a challenge, or was it just fun? I'm not a very good rider, and yes, it was a challenge. <laughs> oh, no, but it's been tons of fun. Yeah, just absolutely fun. amazing. And, oh, uh, and uh, you know, as soon as you think you're on top of your game, mm -hmm. then there's something to bite you in the arse, but it's all good. You could ride it all, and and enjoy it. You challenge yourself, come out a better rider, I'm sure. So what was the most fun part? Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> We've done so it's a, much. It's a blur. It's a blur. <laughs> and a bump. Yeah. Oh, I think some of the canyons would be my favorite. What was the most challenging? Some of the little rock climbs, or there's always more terrain than I can ride, and that's fun. You just go out there and just say, well, you look at a hill or something, and you say, well, there's no possible way I can ride that, but I'm going to try. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
So for people thinking about doing something like this, what, what would you tell them? Um, book early, book often, and just show up with, uh, show up with your crash pads and, and uh, low expectations. You'll be blown away completely. And for someone who has done a little bit of dirt riding but are not very, very good yet, how would they prepare for this? I would probably book a day with Admo before I did this tour. Brush up on all my skills, try some steeper ups and downs, a little bit of rocky sections, just get a feel for the desert. That's what I would do probably. I think if you uh, take a class, a one day class, catching up with the uh, most important skills for dirt bike riding, uh, if you're an enthusiastic person, if you relatively fit uh, you can manage, you can do that ride. I always recommend if you have some friends to come along, if you form the group, we go out with three riders minimum, we can customize the ride based on your skill level, on the skill level of your group. A bunch of New Yorkers, what are, what are you city slickers doing out here in, in the dirt? <laughs> We're just out here to have a good time. Yeah, some real riding. Uh, it's going real well. We're all uh, riders from when we were young, and uh, New York got all built up, so there's nowhere to ride anymore. So we have to come to California to get on a motorcycle. <laughs> so we leave our wives and families, and, <laughs> and here we are. Uh, right, Hi, good. honey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did about uh, first day. I'm gonna guess about 100. Second day about 100. Today's uh, half day. What? What do we do today? 40? 30, 30, 30. Yeah. So did you expect this terrain to be as varied as it is here? It's fantastic. You got anything you want here. Hills, yeah. rocks, sand, you name it. Yeah. Any um, accidents or broken pegs or something? Just bruised <laughs> egos. <laughs> we, we know about that. <laughs> Don't try this at home. That's a good one. All right. that, that was day one. Yeah. It gets better. You know, you have like four wipeouts the first day. <laughs> Two the second day yeah, and none yeah, today. Yeah, exactly. We all get together every year, go for a ride. Even though I've done Baja a half a dozen times, I think the riding up here is better. You know, it's, it just seems that down there, we're just, you're just basically riding dirt roads. And here is that you're actually out in trails and you're doing different terrain. I mean, I, I think it's, it's it's very different. I prefer, the, two, I prefer the train, yeah. Two best guides in the country right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. These Definitely. guys took us through thick and thin. All right. <laughs> you know, long and short. <laughs> steep and deep. Yeah. Wants to make, make sure we feel this pain for a couple of weeks. <laughs> you will. <laughs> He's really working us over. It's all in good fun, though. Yeah. All in good fun. It's great. Behind me is the Californian desert. Hot wild and unfriendly, unless you are on a motorcycle. After a whole day of super hard riding, even the toughest of the roughest need a break, and the best place to stop is Randsburg, a living ghost town. It's very fascinating, uh, I think especially for foreigners, I'm from Europe and coming over here when I saw that first time I was amazed. You're coming in a little teeny bitty of a town, uh, a living ghost town. The buildings are still standing there from back from 1880 when Gold Rush was in its peak and everybody was uh, basically living off the land, mining, finding gold, finding tungsten, finding silver and they established all those trading routes out here in the desert and some of those routes are our routes we're taking today thanks to the miners back in those days they cut all those trails and routes we are still having them we have those uh, I call them desert highways dirt roads which we can use in all directions and here behind me you can see the real house of blues According to the 2005 National Survey on Recreation and the Environment, off-road motorsport recreation has practically exploded since the early 80s. Over 50 million people 
had participated in driving dirt bikes or four-wheel ATVs during 2003-2004. That's way over a 100% increase since 1982. So we're here in Randsburg, a living ghost town. I'm here with a bunch of living ghosts. So <laughs> tell me, what's going on here? What do you do here? Well, uh, we're from Nevada, and we come down every year, this group that you see here. Uh, my friend Ted and I have ridden in this area for, well, I've known him for 42 years, and we rode this area a lot when we were young, and we rode endurals in it, so we thoroughly enjoy the whole area and the town. So are you having fun in the dirt? We are having fun in the dirt. Love the dirt mustache. <laughs> we're not spring chickens anymore, you know. He's uh, 81, and I'm only 69. We're roughing it. Yeah. Totally roughing yeah. it. No showers for two days. All right, okay. Just enjoy what this place has to offer. It's just uh, phenomenal riding. They keep it open. Hope they still, you know, continue to keep it open and with proper management and everything else. Um. So you have you got everything. You have just the, your regular road trails, like dirt, and then you have some sand. You have the rocks. You have hills. Mm -hmm. You can climb. Um, you can go on long day rides like we've done today, or you can just putt around. There's little tracks everywhere. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to do it. Get a little dirty. It's fun. Get back up. Yeah. Go again. <laughs> okay. You can always take a shower later. Yeah. What about Ran Ransburg here? Is a living ghost town? Do you this is my first time yeah. here. Yeah. We just got here. This was our first stop mm -hmm. to fix the tire, and then uh, it looks pretty ghost-like. <laughs> and have like a beer or something at the bar, yeah. and then ride back. Let's ride! <laughs> That cold, carbonated, fermented beverage has never tasted better than at the end of that first day. Our legs felt like jello, our brains were exhausted, and we fell asleep at 9 o'clock. The bed and breakfast is uh, owned by a lady who moved there from South Africa. The bike riding around here is the finest in the country. On holiday weekends, we are inundated with bikes. Really, there's thousands here. And it's a very small town, so we're, we're not always up to it. <laughs> and with the food aspect, uh, sometimes people wait a long time. Do you ever run out of food with that many visitors? Uh, I nearly did once, nearly. But um, they have run out down at the store a few times. Oh, um, yeah, no, there's thousands of people come here. The Bed and breakfast is just a very cozy little place right in the middle of dirt bike riding. The fantastic thing on Rainsburg on that place is that you hop out of bed in the morning, you get on the dirt bike and you just leave and you're in the middle of the desert right there. <laughs> I should know. And immediately we get into <clears throat> our playground, what we call our playground. Um, we have a lot of choices over there. There's an opportunity for a lot of hill climbs, uh, a lot of sand washes. Or simply we can drop down a little lower and, and sort of take it easy and cruise along. Um, all of it still has a, a decent amount of challenge built into it though, okay? And remember the ADMO motto, we're not happy till you're not happy. Day two had some tremendous amount of variation and challenges. Single trails, mountains, boulders, mud, and the actual canyon where the old prospectors used to ride their donkeys. We we're on our way to Death Valley. Very little has changed in these parts of California. It looked the same a hundred years ago when the old prospectors were walking here with their donkeys looking for gold. As modern prospectors, we are on our way to find gold as well. This time we don't have to dig, but we still have to be lucky to strike it rich in Las Vegas.
and the history is still there today. You know, you come around the corner and suddenly you see some prospectors. How do you find gold? Gold is in this gravel that's all over the hillsides here. Yeah. It, comes, it comes out of the ground exactly the way it is. Walt Bickle established this camp in 1934 after the Great Depression really got in full swing. Originally he had a small machine shop and repair shop in Los Angeles and the Great Depression put him out of business. He came out to the canyon originally in 27 with friends on a prospecting tour and he had already found out that he can find enough gold here to support himself and his family. So he moved out here full time, started mining just like it was a regular full time job. All the equipment you see around here, a lot of it he used, a lot of it he made. The biggest gold nugget that was ever found in the El Paso Mountains weighed 22 pounds. This is a sample of the pans that the old miners used to use for everything. They cooked in these, they panned in them, they fixed their meals in them, they washed their socks in them, they used them to shave. That's all they carried, and a few clothes, and a little bit of food, and that's it. It was made by Henry Ford and Son when Henry Ford only had one, somewhere between 1922 and 1923. This one's in such good shape, it still has compression when you crank it over. <laughs> Extremely good seals the oil in there's probably 50 years old or more. Uh, so there were several very, very big mines in the mountain range. Uh, some of them are as much as 1,500 feet deep and more with nobody knows for sure how many yards of drift from the bottom of the tunnel. How much gold do you think they have found here before you came here? I haven't any idea and you will never get any miner to tell you that. <laughs> a miner out here, especially a lone miner, will never tell you what they've got because their lives depend on not telling you. Out in a country like this you can get shot in the back and robbed and nobody will know about it for weeks. Yeah. Walt Bickle, like I said earlier, was a dear friend of mine. And I'm like everybody else. I asked him for 10 solid years, how much did you take out of this mountain range? How much gold? How much value? He refused to tell me, even after 10 years of trying. In my estimation, less than one half of 1% of the gold was ever removed from this area. <laughs> That's nothing. That's nothing. <laughs> now over here behind me is a Cadillac engine, old flathead eight, V8 that may possibly have been used in a World War I tank. Anything that's been on the ground for 50 years or more has to stay on the ground. It's considered an archeological site. Well, in the El Paso mountain range, we have virtually every element that's on the periodic table. And a lot of it comes in very, very complex ore, which is why there's no major mining company involved. They don't like complex ores. They're too expensive to process. They say that riding a motorcycle is like flying. Riding a dirt bike is not like flying. You actually do fly quite a bit. Thousands of years ago, this used to be filled with water. All I'd like to know is, where did all the fish go? When you ride across the plains, you see these pinnacles in the distance. And they don't look like much from far away. But as you get nearer, they grow in size quite a bit. Some are 140 feet tall, and there are over 500 of them. Formed underwater 10,000 to 100,000 years ago. It's like being on a different planet. I think it was 2000, first time when I came in that area. It was a Sunday, I remember that. I came over the hill in between some of those pinnacles and I see this thing sitting there, this machinery. I couldn't really figure out what it is. It looked like an aircraft crashed right there. 
and I came closer, walked to it. It's out of styrofoam, wooden styrofoam. So what the heck is this? And as I uh, uh, keep exploring in the area, a ranger comes up and uh, he tells me that they're shooting the movie Planet of the Apes right there. You know, it's still got some air in it, it's like, so you can pump it up. Fair. Right here is a nail. See that? I'm gonna pump up. Pump it up. Oh, Mark, get pump it. up the volume. Get it. <laughs> Three thousand more. You're almost there. I'm a smoker. <laughs> I think it's about there. No, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a three thousand right now. Yeah. This guy is an asshole. <laughs> Even if riding your dirt bike consumes all of your attention and effort, you can't help thinking about the old prospectors riding their mules over these hard mountains and hot deserts. We think we have a tough all morning until lunch when we meet up with the support van again and have a juicy hamburger. The prospectors had barely anything at all to eat. What fascinates me the most is the story of the old 49ers. Part of our ride through Death Valley is uh, crossing the Funeral Mountains. Death Valley, Funeral Mountain. Horrifying names, if you think about. 1849, a group of prospectors marched towards California, trying to cross the area. Their guide thought he had a fantastic shortcut here, and uh, taking them across a mountain range into the valley, which is now called Death Valley. The mountain range itself was so difficult to cross that much of their livestock already died or uh, passed away due to the difficulty to cross that they didn't have anything. Ending up right there, the water was horrible, they were already exhausted, and they saw this giant mountain range to the west, which they now have to cross in order to get further. Their guides didn't know 100% where, where to go and how to get out of that valley. So the group stayed back and the guides started on scouting for the easiest route to get out of the valley. And it took days and days and days until they actually found a way around. They slaughtered their oxen, burned their wagons, they made beef jerky out of the, the beef they had from their oxen, and they carried whatever they could carry on themselves and uh, traversed the other mountain ranges. Ended up in uh, Los Angeles instead of San Francisco because it was impossible during the winter time to get over the Sierra Mountains. And so you see the naked landscape. And it's like an open book when you sometimes look at those rock formations. You can see layers and layers, especially if you go into Death Valley. Uh, there is this nice, beautiful drive, this artist drive. You're driving through the artist plate. That's a washed out landscape, eroded landscape with all kinds of different minerals. I don't know what it is all in all, but you have yellow, you have red, probably some iron. I don't know what it is. but all kind of different colors mixed into the dirt with uh, hundreds of years or thousands of years of, of bending and twisting. So you have all those great looking lines and formations. In there. Being this far away from civilization makes you feel the wings of history brushing against you. Very little has changed since the gold rush. And if you had been transported back in time somehow, you wouldn't know it. So here we are a Charlie's place. And believe it or not, they used to sell hamburgers here. We were so inspired by the story of the old 49ers that we too wanted to find some gold. So we stopped at an old mine to explore. Okay, follow me, I got the flashlight. Somewhere in these tunnels, we might find gold. I'm sure they don't mind if we take a little sample home with us. Uh-oh, uh, we better get going. At first glance, this desert looks like a bunch of dry nothingness. Just a lot of sand and rocks. But we soon learn that it's full of riches beyond just gold. One of those riches is borax. It's being used in almost everything we come across in daily life. We found the Borax Museum out in the middle of nowhere, and we got the tour. When I first walked in here, I didn't realize that this is actually 
a real piece. You can mistake it for just an artificial you know, mock-up <laughs> because it, it's so fantastic. It looks like glass or plastic, but this is yes. the real deal, right? Yes, this is what they crush up. One of the things that has been in for many, many years is in uh, insulation, fiberglass insulation. Dow Corning has dishes that has borate in it where you can take them from the freezer, put it in the oven. Shuttle, space shuttle, tiles on a space shuttle has borate in them to resist the tremendous heat in me. space. Yeah. Cosmetics Just... clean your face. Uh -huh. Most of your soil has borax in it or borate. But when you get in a situation where an area is depleted of the borate, it don't grow very good, even with being fertilized. So they add borate to it to help it to grow. Egyptians use it in mummification. Aaron Winters and his wife found borax. They did something and let it on fire and then said, by golly, it burns green, we're rich. And they <laughs> sold it for something like, I don't know, it seemed like it was $500. Of course, back then, $500 was a pretty good chunk of money. Yeah, right. <laughs> Little did they know. <laughs> yeah. It would be yeah. a spaceship later, right? What's, what's a spaceship? Yeah. Mars or something, <laughs> I don't know. Coleman was the one that started Death Valley, getting the borate set up to come out of Death Valley. So they had wagons built in Mojave. They used mules, of course, to pull the wagon with. One fellow named Mathers convinced Borak Smith that, uh, you know, you need a logo to advertise, and uh, how about a, the 20 mule team? But it actually was a, two horses and 18 mules. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. The horses were on the, on the single tree or the tongue of the wagon, and they kind of kept the wagon going. The mules were all hooked to a chain, and oh. the two horses hooked directly to the tongue of the wagon and the mules were taught to step over the chain to make a nice bow in it mm -hmm. so they could make the corner a nice, smooth, round corner. Right. One of the distinctive ways to tell whether it's eulocyte is you can put it on a surface, it'll bring whatever's underneath it up to the top. And we nicknamed it TV rock. That's amazing, that's like fiber optics, right? It's similar to the fiber optics, yes. I had no idea that borax was that versatile or that 40% of the world's borax come from the Mojave Desert. Yet another great discovery on this remarkable motorcycle adventure. I think it was uh, somewhere in the early years, 1910, somewhere around there. Um, he came out here in the West because the doctor told him so. He had uh, tuberculosis and he was from Rhode Island and he just uh, didn't have much future. That's what the doctors told him. So he came out here in the West. The tri-climate helped him to get over his illness and he started on working with the local miners. He had no knowledge, no experience, no education about mining. He started on with the locals here and he started on getting his own mine claim and he started on digging and eventually he just dug a hole straight through the mountain. Well, the, the tunnel has three different stories. He started the tunnel for gold. He was looking for gold. Right. And he found a fair amount, but not enough really to make it worthwhile. Uh, nobody really knows why. Uh, he spent about 32 years on digging that hole. The tunnel was dug only on a part-time basis. In the early days, he would work all summer over at Isabella on the ranches and farms, come back here, work all winter on his mining. Um, one of the official explanation had been that he wanted to make a shortcut for the miners, basically a tunnel to transport the ore out of the area. After he really ran out of good gold ore in the tunnel, he decided, well, it'd make a good portage tunnel to get ore from this side of the mountain range to the Cantill side where the mill was. 
But looking at the area, the tunnel is halfway up the mountain. We on the dirt bike drive just around the mountain, and I wonder if the railroad could have been constructed just around the mountain. And of course, there is a third reason. He was a stubborn, thick-headed German, <laughs> and some idiot mining engineer told him one man cannot cut a hole through a mountain. So he, he had to prove the engineer wrong. So I don't know, I think it was a stubborn German and he, <laughs> he just started on digging a hole and just kept going. That was his, um, his uh, obsession, his goal in life, or I don't know what I should say. However, he, is, he established him a monument. Um, he was uh, published in uh, many papers, many newspapers, many books around here. And a lot of people know about that place. And when you go out there on a weekend, you see sometimes hundreds of dirt bikers going to that place, walking through the tunnel with their flashlight. It's about 2,000 foot long tunnel. Visitors from all over the world come to the Mojave Desert to ride. And they are completely blown away by the experience and the breathtaking landscape. So I'm here with two Ducati hot rod devils on the street, right? Guy that. and Nigel, what are you doing out here in the desert? Uh, well, we, we were trying to organise a um, dirt bike tour and uh, we went through uh, a lot of uh, trouble trying to sort it out and then we came across uh, Uve on the internet and uh, we just decided we wanted a real big adventure so uh, we didn't quite know what, know what we were letting ourselves in for, do you know what I mean? But uh, uh -huh. we're still alive after one day so we're quite proud of ourselves. We had the, the full day's training with Uve out on the uh, El Mirage uh, lake bed mm -hmm. and if we hadn't have had that, that that quality of training we wouldn't have got through the first day it was pretty uh, pretty amazing but this is just amazing it's really difficult because you know we're not experienced riders so it's fantastic going through all the terrain and thinking about this but most of the time you know you're thinking about you know trying to stay on your bike and remembering <laughs> the skills we've been taught really so uh, I'd like to say I could think you know a little bit more freely but it's, it's not the case people in Europe wouldn't understand until they come here you could think you've done dirt biking but this is just an another world. I mean, you've done it as well, haven't you? I mean, it's just unbelievable, isn't it? People in Europe wouldn't get their head around how much space there is out here because there's not the space in Europe to do that. And when you can just ride and ride, more or less four hours non-stop before lunch. We were in bed at 9.30 uh, yesterday night. We have never been in bed at 9.30 <laughs> in our life. <laughs> and you've, you've got to be fairly, fairly fit to do it, I think. You, you know, with the, with the heat out here, the strain on your body, you, you positioning yourself in areas that you wouldn't normally be for long periods so you've got to be prepared that um, you're going to be tired at the end of it. I was just talking to, to Mark about how I should do it and he told me to you know how to use my braking but I think as I came over the brow of the hill I sort of grabbed my foot and brake too hard, which locked my front up. Lost total control, shot off round to the left of the, the bush, lost the bike completely and went head over heels. So, you okay, up. no, nothing broken? Nothing broken, little cut on the hand, but the uh, you definitely need all the protectors there. Where, where I landed was rocks everywhere, so uh, thank God for all the gear. We're British, you see, you can keep going. Stiff up a lip, stiff up a lip. Go now before we change our mind, because if we stand up there too long looking at it, yeah. our bottle of the gone. <laughs> it's such a, a mind game, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think this is just something incredible. You're riding through that desert. Yes, of course, it's desert, but it's all more or less hot packed landscape. You don't really see this much loose sand or anything, and suddenly you have those pockets of gigantic dunes. No vegetation on it, nothing at all. Just nice, beautiful, like beach sand and open for riding. Many people, they have a bit trouble with sand and they have some kind of respect from the sand. So when I announce that we go to the dunes today, they think, oh, I'm not sure, I don't know. Do I really want to do that? I just struggled with that sand wash yesterday. And then when we get into the dunes, you have no obstacles. You have these beautiful formations of dunes. 
and you have just this fine sand and you can take momentum, you can take speed and it's, it's, it's almost like a, a symphony if you put some music behind it. It's, 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 it's just this free-spirited riding. After a while, after 10 minutes, usually people get the hang of it, people get the feeling for it, and it's just, it's a blast. It's just a blast. We're coming from the dunes, we're coming through that Sperry Wash, a bit difficult technical riding, and we're dropping in from the backside to China Ranch. We're dropping into this oasis. We're coming through this um, absolute naked desert landscape, and suddenly it opens through the canyon into a lush green little bitty of an oasis, a date farm. Um, I think it had its origination in a gypsum mine, so in the uh, early um, 19th, 20th century, they started on mining for gypsum right there. And I think it was 1920 they uh, put the first seeds into the ground for uh, date palms. And those things grew gigantic big. And today it's a date ranch, farming the dates and making date cookies, date shakes, and date bread, and date this and date that. <laughs> Even in the spring, the desert is warm and dry. We all have so-called camelback backpacks. Basically a water-filled backpack that we drink from through a tube. It's difficult to understand how quickly you can get dehydrated out here. The clients were from the UK. It is May which usually should be quite nice. This was a day where it was in the hundreds, you know, 114 down in Death Valley. Very hot, very warm day. We're starting out. The people from the UK just flew in for that ride, not used to those type of temperatures at all. And you could see their faces in the early morning already very red and, and the dehydration was definitely a big factor there. And I started on real getting worried about that. And we can only carry so much water, you know, we all had our camelbacks, we had the backpack loaded with extra water and I brought even more water. We were loaded up with water, but still we have this 100 miles of absolutely nothing going over that mountain range and there is no way to get back. And in between the two mountain ranges, you're basically stuck. You've got to make it, you've got to make it. If you turn back, you go over a mountain range again. If you go further, you go over the other mountain range and it's tough terrain. And I was really concerned until I really thought about the landscape and I realized I know there is a spring over here I know there is some running water over there I know behind that vegetation there is a little bitty of water and we were able to stay wet almost the whole ride through because I always guided them to a little bitty of water filled up our bottles with just spring water dumped it all over our clothes like a swamp cooler and stayed nice and cool the whole ride the water is actually running underground. So you have the riverbed, but the riverbed is dry. So it runs in the soil underground and then it comes out here and it's on the surface again.
this little bitty of water what we see here might be your only water for quite some long distance and it might be your lifesaver if you're out here and you're very thirsty maybe almost close to dehydration here you are got some water i fill up my water bottle bring it along with me when it gets very hot i can uh, run it over me and uh, have me cooling down like a little swamp cooler and the other thing is i like to have a bit water with me when i'm in such remote locations maybe my cooler breaks and I can use it to fix my motorcycle, wash my hands after fixing the flat tire or whatever. So when I see water out here in the desert, I always collect it, bring it with me. If you're mostly interested in hard dirt bike riding, you can definitely have an all-you-can-eat buffet out here. But I think it's hard not to get interested in the history of this area. You come around the bush and it hits you. This used to be full of Indians, hunting buffalo and it still looks exactly the same. Uh, the whole United States, especially the western part of the United States, used to be uh, inhabited by the uh, Native Americans. And uh, the Native Americans, they used to have this kind of communication system where they chiseled symbols into the rocks, those petroglyphs. And there are some of the canyons, mostly in volcanic lava rock, where you see those rock art chiseled by the Indians, uh, 500 to several thousand years old, and all kind of different symbols. I think nobody really knows what exactly it means. There are all kind of uh, philosophies about it, what it could mean, and uh, I actually have a big book where every little symbol is explained with something, and in the end of the book says we're only guessing that this is what it thinks. <laughs> What was it? Was it like a newspaper? You know, all the concentration of all the, those symbols? So they were real delivering messages one after another? Or was it just a ceremonial place? They spent some time there and it had some kind of a purpose that they had to chisel that in the wall? Thousands of years ago, there was an Indian here named Jeff. you see the, the same symbols at different locations, which are sometimes hundreds of miles apart from each other, and the symbols are almost identical. The incredible thing on those petroglyphs is that they so well kept. They are purposely put on places on rock walls where it is not weathered out that easy, where the rock is such a hard rock that it takes hundreds, if not thousands of years for them to erode. And you go further east, uh, uh, petrified forest, uh, then you go over into New Mexico, and again, you see exactly the same symbols. It's incredible. This is, this is, I guess this is the, the real history out here. Riding through Goler Canyon on our way to Death Valley, we stop at Barker Ranch. This was used as a hideout for the notorious murderer Charles Manson. In the late 60s, passersby thought it was a hippie hangout. Little did they know the gruesome details of the shack's inhabitants. They say there's three more bodies buried in the grounds behind the shack, and um, given the ranch's violent history, it is haunted. So while we're on the subject of culture and history, we want to show you one of the unsolved mysteries of the world, the so-called race track in Northern Death Valley. Before we came to the actual race track, we stopped at the most peculiar thing I have ever seen, Tea Kettle Junction, out in the middle of really nowhere. And of course, Uwe bumps into one of his old buddies right there. Tea Kettle Junction, huh? Tea Kettle Junction. Hey, ah. you got a Husqvarna, nice bike. Yeah. Hey, it's Jerry. Who's this? Hey, you're... Uwe! Yeah. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing hey, here? Good seeing you. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. It's been years. Yeah. What are you doing here? We're going down to the racetrack. Oh, okay. okay. We're on the adventure bike. After many more miles into Death Valley, we finally make it to the racetrack. 
the strangest mystery known to man. We're here in the northern part of Death Valley at the racetrack Playa. A uh, dry lake bed famous for its moving rocks. Rocks racing, uh, probably driven by the wind. Nobody really knows exactly what's happening here, but you clearly can see each rock has like a skid mark behind. So it must be uh, a combination of wet soil and heavy, heavy winds, which drives the, the rocks. Heavy rocks, I mean, rocks of um, many, many pounds, which starting on gently moving over the surface of that lake bed. Look at this, this crazy rock, he came straight racing in here and then suddenly he decided to make a 90 degrees turn. I think there are some aliens. Aliens, they coming in and at the right condition, they're moving the rocks, you know, they're pushing the rocks to the right place. They're watching us right now. They're sitting somewhere up there and they're laughing about us. Those crazy people, what are they thinking? Moving rocks? No way! You know, I have no idea how long that takes, if that is a process which goes over 100 years or over 1,000 years, I have no idea. I mean, fact is, researchers have tried to find out, have tried to see the rocks moving, and nobody has seen that as of yet. Nobody has a real proof of how the rocks are moving. And it's speculation based on what we see here on the surface of that dry lake bed. So it is absolutely clear, they're moving. But how are they moving? What exactly causes them to move? Is it real the wind? Or are we having some different forces here? There are all kinds of speculations. Some people, they think there might be some um, forces from other planets who causes the rocks to move. No one has ever seen them move. I think the ghosts of Death Valley would suck me down there. Well, after all those digressions about culture and history, let's get back to our tour again. Day 3 starts out in Death Valley. It's hot. No one believes we will ride through snow at the end of the day. We are just 100 feet below sea level. It's warm. It might be a January or February day now, but we are down in the valley and it's warm. You start the day in the t-shirt and I do my briefing. I tell the people what we find today. We're gonna climb over the mountain range. We're gonna go over the spring mountains into Las Vegas. And I tell them, bring your jacket. We're gonna have snow. <laughs> Nobody believes it because if you look around, it's, it's desert, it's hot already. Eight o'clock in the morning. And as the afternoon approached, every time we're there, between those winter months till late April, you, I guarantee you, you're gonna be in snow crossing that last mountain. Um, it is a ride where you have to cover a, a distance in order to get to the destination. It's not just playing, it's not just like riding in your backyard where you could bail out anytime you want to. When you start in the morning, you're basically committed. You got a 120 to 150 mile day and that's quite a day. That's a full day of riding and seeing scenery and enjoying all the landscapes and possibly even some of the history out there but it is a destination. You do have to get to the next location and sometimes it is pushing the limit a little bit. But it's fun, we always make it. Well, no, I usually don't ride riverbeds. No way, you gotta get through here, you know. This is our route. Right, this is the end of the road. Rock yard. <laughs> this is the end of the road. Just washed out from the weather. Yeah. No. They're not as big in New Jersey? No. Yeah. yeah. have rocks like that right here. Yeah, this is crazy. <laughs> My experience going through something like that is uh, a low speed. I usually have it in first gear and I have two fingers on the clutch, feathering the clutch a little bit as I'm going through here. Uh, because you can't really predict what you have in front. And you gotta look relatively far out to pick a line. If you look too close to your front wheel, you have no chance. Joe first. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. All yeah, right. let's do yeah. it. Yeah, I think yeah. it's time.
That is tough. Uh, I'm glad we're taking a break. I'm exhausted. I think I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> How many guys don't make it? I would say, you know, it's probably about uh, uh, a 70%, which is not having an easy time going through here. Yeah. Technical. Good stuff. Good job, hey. You guys doing quite well here. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Most of our groups struggle a little bit in that stuff, yeah. yeah. So after skidding and sliding through the snow and over Spring Mountain, we're finally on the last rocky downhill. We are approaching the Red Rock Canyon National Park, just outside Las Vegas. It felt so incredible to have real traction from a regular street surface again that we took one extra spin around the Red Rock Park, just to look at the scenery there. From Tinseltown to Sin City in three days, we are no longer beginner dirt bike riders. We have grown quite a bit. Nothing broken, a few bruises of course. Bikes held up fine. Flat tires are very common, but I guess we were lucky. In the beginning, we tried to avoid every rock we saw, out of plain fear. At the end of the last day, we rode over anything that was in our way. The bikes could take everything that was on the ground, and we had learned to just flow with the bumps. Riding up the strip in Vegas on our dirt bikes, dusty and muddy, people staring, made us feel like real explorers coming back to civilization from a long journey through the wilderness. Wow! We made it! We made it! Huh? We yeah. made it. I can't believe it! Okay. What a trip! 420 miles! 420 miles! 420 miles! And here we are in Vegas, Vegas. Uh, Bas yeah. Bas Man, what a trip! <laughs> that was an amazing tour! Thank you! <laughs> Thank you so, so much! Okay, so we have a bar, bro. We did it! <laughs> Not only did we accomplish this challenging ride, but we also immersed ourselves in the history and culture of the Mojave Desert. If you ever get a chance to explore this area for yourself, don't pass it up. This is an open book of wonders that hasn't changed for thousands of years. And the best part is, you can explore it all from the seat of a motorcycle.
And here you see snow! Oh, get out of here! Snow? In the Californian desert? I don't think so. This, my friends, is salt.